Chapter 8 The Cambrian Explosion, 600-500 M.A. Photographs of Charles Darwin when he had reached 70 years old seem to show a man weathered well beyond this chronological age. This seems a man perhaps 80 or older. Yet at 70, Darwin was in his last years, and perhaps this physical antiquity was a product of stress as well as the diseases he may have contracted in the tropics when, as a young man on HMS Beagle, he slowly circumnavigated the globe. Perhaps it was being so vexed by his many critics, as well as his own distress at his inability to understand how organisms inherited traits. Genetics was not accepted until the early 20th century, when the work of Gregor Mendel was rediscovered. And especially the nature of the Cambrian explosion must have taken their emotional as well as physical toll. Darwin hated the fossil record in general, and the Cambrian in particular. A vexation with the Cambrian fossil record followed him to his grave. It was this and his inability to know how genetics worked that surely were among his greatest regrets. Since well before the time of Darwin, it was known that fossils of animal life seemed to appear suddenly in the fossil record. The great English geologist Adam Sedgwick, the author and definer of the Cambrian period itself, mapped its base as the strata containing the first trilobites. While we now first think of the various geological periods as time, in fact they came into existence as a succession of strata, with the bottom bed defined by some fossil first appearing, and its top defined either by the extinction of some fossil, or better yet, a different species first appearing. In this case, this was the Cambrian system, based on piles of strata in Wales. The Cambrian period is the time during which these Cambrian strata accumulated. No more, no less. Sedgwick found that over short straddle intervals, sedimentary rocks seemingly bereft of fossils were found to be overlain by rocks with a profusion of highly visible fossils the most common being trilobites. Trilobites are fossil arthropods, and thus their fossils are the remains of highly evolved and complex animals. This observation was vexing to Darwin, and hugely comforting to his critics, as it seemed to fly in the face of the then newly proposed theory of evolution. Charles Darwin thus went to his grave, cursing the fossil record. His genius was such that he knew he was right, Yet, till the end of his life, he was bedeviled by critics who pointed out that the first life on earth was of such complexity that it was inconceivable that the evolutionary processes so eloquently argued by Darwin in the many editions of his great work on the origin of species could have produced such complications as a trilobite. Yet the great irony is that trilobites did not appear until the Cambrian was at least half over. One of the iconic fossils, trilobites were arthropods that dominated oceanic habitats relatively early in the history of animals on Earth. But how early? In Darwin's time, trilobites were thought to be the earliest of all animals. Yet they are undoubtedly complicated, with three body sections, complex eyes and limbs, and large size. Some of the earliest could be up to two feet long. This was not what the earliest animals ought to have looked like, small and generalized, not large, complicated kinds of animals. We now know that trilobites were not, not even close in fact, to being the first animals. The history of the origin of animals on Earth is one of life's most fascinating chapters and also one of the most controversial. There is also a great deal of new information that has been gleaned even in the last ten years there are two distinct lines of evidence giving quite different views on the timing of the first diversification of animal phyla. One of these lines comes from the pattern of appearance of animal fossils in rocks, the second from molecular clock studies on extant animals. They give important clues to one of the greatest of all paleontological mysteries, the rapid diversification of animals. The first major line of evidence about the Cambrian explosion comes from fossils. The appearance of animals leaving evidence of themselves in the rock record came in four successive waves. The first began around 575 million years ago 
and has been called the Avalon Explosion, a name coming from the part of eastern Canada where the oldest of this group were found. The second wave is coincident with the almost complete disappearance of the Ediacarans, and is characterized not by actual fossils, but with accurate traces of their locomotion. These numerous trace fossils could only have been formed by active locomotion of multicellular organisms, animals. They are as old as 560 million years, but most are about 550 million years in age. The sea bottoms would have been alive with actively moving, small, worm-like forms. The third breakthrough was the appearance of skeletons, great numbers of tiny skeletal elements in strata less than 550 million years in age. They are very small spines and scales of calcium carbonate that would have covered the animals with a coating of these small skeletons, almost like tiles. Finally, the larger fossilized animals appeared, including trilobites. The clam-like brachiopods, spiny echinoderms, and many kinds of snail-like mollusks, all in strata younger than 530 million years in age. In Darwin's day, none of the earlier three were known, and the Cambrian was marked by the first appearance of trilobites in sedimentary strata. The reasons for this sequence might be deceptively simple. Oxygen levels, which rose to their highest levels of the world up until then. Today, we know that this succession of animal life originations appeared comparatively rapidly in the fossil record, and new dating techniques now puts the time of the first complex fossils, the small skeletal fossils, which are 20 to 10 million years younger than the first trace fossils, at slightly older than 540 million years ago, with the first trilobites appearing in the record some 20 million years after that. The appearance of animals in the fossil record recorded a significant event, which has been called the Cambrian Explosion. To paleontologists, the Cambrian Explosion marked the first appearance of most major animal phyla large enough to leave remains in the rock record. To molecular geneticists, the Cambrian marked the first evolution of animals. The controversy raged through the 1990s, to be solved in the early years of this century when new molecular studies, using more sophisticated analyses, essentially confirmed the younger date for the origin of animals that had been championed by paleontologists. There is now agreement that animal life on Earth did not predate 635 million years ago, and might be closer to 550 million years in age. The Cambrian period is now dated from 542 to about 495 million years ago, although the latter date for the base of the Ordovician might be slightly older. However, the vast majority of animal phyla first appeared in a small portion of this interval, between 530 and 520 MA. All specialists agree that this is the third or fourth most important event in the entire history of life, superseded in importance only by the first appearance of life on Earth, the adaptation to molecular oxygen, and the origin of the eukaryotic cell. According to our best new information, the oxygen level soon after the start of the Cambrian explosion was about 13%, compared to 21% today, but then fluctuated. During this time, carbon dioxide levels were far higher than they are in the world today, hundreds of times higher, in fact, and such high levels would have produced an intense greenhouse effect, sufficiently high to overcome the fact that the sun at this time was around 5% less intense than it is today. Even with the drop in CO2 levels at the end of this interval, temperatures of this time would have been perhaps the highest of any period in the history of animal life on Earth. Since less oxygen is dissolved in seawater with higher temperatures, the already anoxic conditions of the oceans would have been exacerbated. The panoply of fossils that have been preserved showing both hard and their soft parts fossils from the fantastic and newly discovered deposits in the Chenyang region of China has given us a new window into the origin of the animal phyla on Earth and the nature of life on the Cambrian planet prior to the most famous of all fossil deposits, the Burgess Shale of British Columbia. The Chenyang beds are now known to have been deposited between 520 and 515 million years ago, 
whereas the Burgess Shale is now thought to be no older than 505 million years in age. The approximately 10 million years separating the age of these two deposits thus gives us a new view of how animals diversified. Because both Chenyang and the Burgess preserve soft parts as well as skeletonized animals, we have a good picture of what was there in what relative abundance. Without this added view yielded by the preservation of soft parts, we would never be sure about the relative abundance of various kinds of animals. For perhaps there was a huge abundance of creatures like soft worms and jellyfish, forms that did not have skeletons. Thus our surprise at what appears to be a clear view of the nature of the fauna at both sites. There have now been over 50,000 fossils collected from the Burgess Shale, and a lesser number of from Chen Yang. In their masterful summary of the Burgess fauna, Derek Briggs, Doug Irwin, and Fred Collier, in their 1994 book The Fossils of the Burgess Shale, list a total of 150 species of animals. Almost half are arthropods or arthropod-like, but an even more interesting number relates to the number of individuals. Well over 90% of all fossils are from arthropods, followed by sponges and brachiopods. Like the earlier Chen Yang, the Burgess Sea Bottom was dominated both in kinds and numbers of animals by the arthropods. Arthropods are among the most complex of all invertebrates. And yet, in these almost earliest of fossil deposits in the time of animals, they are diversified and common. It speaks to a long evolution prior to their first appearance in the record. Perhaps seabeds crawling with millimeter-long, or less, arthropods, with many more species swimming or floating in the open sea itself. One of the great surprises of a visit to the Burgess Shale, which both of the authors of this book have been fortunate enough to do, is the realization that the most common fossils come not from the exotic taxa, the many exquisite, soft-bodied creatures that fill the pages of the many books devoted to the Burgess, Shale, Fauna, and Flora, but the fact that most of the fossils come from trilobites. They and the less numerous but highly diverse arthropods of the Burgess dominate the assemblage, in sheer numbers of individuals and species, and in sheer numbers of different kinds of body plants, which is described by a measure called disparity, and compared to diversity, which refers to the number of different kinds of taxa. The arthropods seem to have been the most successful of Cambrian animals. How much of this success was due to their principal body plan characteristic, segmentation? Segmented animals are the most diverse of all animals on the planet, and most are arthropods. All arthropods, including the highly diverse insects, show repeated body units and body regions based on groupings of individual segments that have specific functions for the animal. The feature uniting the group is the presence of a jointed exoskeleton that encloses the entire body. This exoskeleton even extends into the gut. The exoskeleton cannot grow, so it must be periodically molted and replaced by another slightly larger one. The body has a well-differentiated head, trunk, and posterior regions in varying proportions. Appendages are commonly specialized. On terrestrial arthropods, the appendages are usually single, enormous. But the marine forms generally have two branches or parts per appendage, an inner leg branch and an outer gill branch, and are thus termed by ramus. The exoskeleton encloses the soft parts like a suit of armor and that may be its major function, protection. But the consequences of this kind of skeleton are huge. There can be no passive diffusion of oxygen across any part of the body. To obtain oxygen, the first arthropods, all marine, had to evolve specialized respiratory structures or gills. Segmented animals are the most diverse of all animals on the planets. Arthropods are not alone in this trait. All annelids are segmented, and some members of generally non-segmented groups, such as the monoplacophoran mollusks, show at least some segmentation. It appeared early in the history of animals, and indeed in the Cambrian trilobites, we see that the most common of these early preserved animal fossils show this trait. In his 2004 book, On the Origin of Phyla, 
James Valentine also reflects on what is a major evolutionary puzzle. Why are there so many and so many kinds of arthropods in the Cambrian? It is worthwhile to look at what he has written on this subject. Although many early arthropods had non-mineralized cuticles, a marvelous diversity of early arthropod body types has come to light, so many and so distinctive as to pose important problems in applying the principles of systematics. These disparate arthropod types are phylogenetically puzzling. This evidently sudden burst of evolution of arthropod-like body types is outstanding, even among the Cambrian explosion taxa. What we call arthropods are composed of what appear to be, perhaps, many independently evolved groups that have, through convergent evolution, produced body plans of great diversity save for one aspect. All have limbs on each segment that are by ramus. Each appendage carries a leg of some sort, and a second appendage, a long gill. Why would basal animal groups opt for segmentation? Perhaps this is the wrong word, for Valentine and others note that the arthropods are not so much segmented, which at least in annelids is composed of largely separated chambers for each segment of the body, but repeated. Valentine proposes that this striking body plan arose in response to locomotor needs, stating, Clearly, the segmented nature of the arthropod's body is related to the mechanics of body movement, particularly to locomotion with nerve and blood supplies in support. There is no doubt that this type of body plan is an adaptation aiding locomotion. But a consequence of this kind of body plan is to allow repeated gill segments, each small enough to be held in optimal orientation beneath the segments. In these positions, flows of water can be actively pumped over and through the feather-shaped gills, thereby increasing the availability of oxygen molecules hitting the gills each second, a position suggested by Ward in 2006. Another animal found in abundance in the oldest of the Cambrian-aged deposits are sponges. Like the Cnidarians, sponges show no respiratory structures, nor would we expect any. With a body plan built around a series of sacs, like the Cnidarians, but with even less organization, there are no true tissues in a sponge, all sponges show a very high surface area to volume. In fact, sponges are like agglomerations of numerous single-celled organisms, with each cell essentially in contact with seawater. But even with this advantage, sponges show an even more efficient way of gaining oxygen. Their main feeding cell, called a coanocyte, causes large volumes of water to pass through the structure. Some sponge specialists have suggested that a sponge passes as much as 10,000 times its volume in seawater through its body each day. Consequently, sponges are capable of living in extremely low oxygen conditions because they so efficiently move large volumes of water through their body, getting enough oxygen even from water that has little. The major groups of animals with hard parts in the Cambrian are obviously the huge tribe of arthropods, followed in numerical importance in most Cambrian marine strata by brachiopods and then smaller numbers of echinoderms and mollusks. Brachiopods are a still living group related to bryozoans that are routinely mistaken for bivalve mollusks. Yet while the shells of bivalves and brachiopods show a superficial similarity, the internal anatomy of the two groups are radically different. The major feature of a brachiopod is a feeding organ known as a lophophore, composed of a large loop with numerous long, thin fingers producing a delicate fan-like shape within the shell. This organ filters seawater for food, and as it is filled with a body fluid and is very thin, it serves also as an exquisite respiratory organ. For some of us, the brachiopods are a tragic group. Perhaps the most common inhabitants of Paleozoic sea bottoms, they were nearly wiped out by the Permian extinction around 250 million years ago and never regained dominance. Cambrian echinoderms make up a weird assemblage of small, box-like animals. Among the earliest echinoderms were peculiar, pine-cone-shaped helioplacoids, 
with some primitive stalked eocrinoids and edrioasteroids found in some deposits as well. More common than echinoderms were mollusks. Most during the Cambrian were small in size, and each of the major classes, gastropods, bivalves, and cephalopods, is found in Cambrian strata. The most common mollusks, however, were monoplacophorans, a minor class today but common in the Cambrian. They had a limpet-like shell and a snail-like body with a broad, creeping foot. Most interestingly, alone among mollusks of the time, they showed a body organization that suggests segmentation. From looking at muscle scars on the fossil shells and comparing anatomy from the still-living forms, we think the Cambrian monoplacophorans had multiple gills. Modern-day gastropods have a single pair of gills, or even just a single gill. But the Cambrian monoplacophorans, which lived a very snail-like existence in all likelihood, found it necessary to have multiple gills. They are celebrated as the ancestral mollusk that would give rise to all the rest, the gastropods, cephalopods, bivalves, ketons, and more minor molluscan classes. Long thought to have gone extinct at the end of the Permian, the discovery of living monoplacophorans in deep-sea settings in the 1950s led to a much greater understanding of the life of the early mollusks. The living forms confirmed what muscle scars found on the interior of the earliest monoplacophoran fossils asserted, that there was more than a single pair of gills. In fact, multiple pairs of muscles line the entire length of the interior of the shell, leading to the conclusion that these early forms showed an evident segmentation or at least repeat of the gill blood vessel system. Since it is only the gills and supporting blood and filtering systems that show this repeated pattern, it can be surmised that as in arthropods, this repeated pattern was an adaptation for increased respiratory surface area of the gills. A somewhat similar pattern of repetition, extending even to the shell, is found in the chitons, today commonly found on intertidal beaches. Like the body of an echinoderm, the interior of a brachiopod shell is almost all water. There is very little flesh, and what is there stays in contact with the steady flow of seawater. The brachiopod lophophore creates several currents of seawater that pass into the sides of the shell, move across the lophophore, and are then sent out the front of the shell. This constant stream of new water entering a brachiopod has the same effect as the current passing through a sponge. The small volume of flesh to the great surface area of the lophophore, coupled with the steady flow of water, many times the volume of the interior of the shell, makes the brachiopod consummately adapted for a world of low oxygen. Physical and Chemical Events Causing the Cambrian Explosion Earlier in this book, we noted the advance of entirely new disciplines of science, most notably astrobiology and its allied field, geobiology. But another field, this one a traditional mainstay of the biological sciences, mainly evolutionary development, has undergone a renaissance so important that it can almost be considered a new field as well. Its practitioners now call it evo-devo, and breakthroughs in this field have had a lot to say about the Cambrian explosion in the last decade. One of the greatest of evo-devo practitioners, Sean Carroll, has given us an exquisite tour of this newly revivified area of science in his 2005 book, Endless Forms Most Beautiful. If there is any single theme in this work, it is that science can now understand far better one of the previously intractable problems in evolutionary biology, the origin of novelty. How evolutionary innovation took place over relatively short periods of time just could not be explained by traditional Darwinian concepts of evolution. The radical breakthroughs, be it the appearance of wings, legs for land, segmentation in arthropods, or even large size, the hallmark of the Cambrian explosion, could not stand up to stories about many and sudden mutations all working in concert to somehow radically change an organism. Evo Devo now seems to have solved this, 
and in his book, Carroll lists four aspects that combined can explain sudden evolutionary innovation that nicely encapsulates the new way of explaining how radical changes did take place. The first secret to innovation, as Carroll puts it, is to work with what is already present. The concept that nature works as a tinkerer is central to this. Innovation does not always need a new set of equipment to build, or even a new set of tools. What is already present is the easiest route. Second and third are two aspects understood by Darwin himself, multifunctionality and redundancy. Multifunctionality first is using an already present morphology or physiology to take over some second function in addition to that for which it was first evolved. Redundancy, on the other hand, is when some structure is composed of several parts that complete some function. If one of these can be then co-opted for some new kind of job, while the remaining parts are still able to function as before, there is in place a clear path for innovation that is far easier to use than the total de novo formation of some entirely novel morphology from scratch. Cephalopods swimming and respiration are like this. Cephalopods routinely pump huge quantities of water over their gills, and like many invertebrates, used separated tubes, or designated channels, for water coming in and water being expelled, to ensure that oxygen-rich water is not rebreathed. But with minor morphological tinkering with this X-current tube, a powerful new means of locomotion came about. Breathing and moving could now take place using the same amount of energy by utilizing the same volume of water for respiration and movement. The final secret is modularity. Animals built of segments, such as the arthropods, and to a lesser extent we vertebrates, are already composed of modules. The limbs branching off arthropod segments have been amazingly modified into feeding, mating, and locomotion, as well as many other functions. Arthropods are like a Swiss army knife with each segment bearing limbs evolved to do a very specific function. The same is true in vertebrates with our digits, which have been modified to tasks as varied as walking on land to swimming to flying in the air. Not bad for some primitive fingers and toes. Where does the evo-devo come into play? It turns out that these morphologies are the soft putty for morphological change because they are underlain by systems of genetic switches geographically located on the developing embryo in the same positions as the various limbs are found in the arthropod or vertebrate. Switches are the key here. They tell various parts of the body when and where to grow. One of the great discoveries is that the exact sequence of different body regions on an arthropod from its head to mid-region to abdomen are lined up first on chromosomes in the same geographic pattern and then on the developing embryo itself. Much of this is done by the crown jewels of the Evo-Devo kingdom, the Hox genes, and their differently named but equivalents in other taxonomic groups. The many new discoveries of Evo-Devo have certainly been brought to bear on the many questions to be solved about that central mystery in the history of life, the Cambrian explosion, and the most important understandings of all the timing of when and how the various animal phyla, and thus separate body plans that we see today, originated. There have long been two schools of thought. The first is that the fossil record gives us a true picture of when the great differentiation of animals actually took place, phyletic divergence somewhere about 550 to perhaps 600 million years ago. But the second line of evidence comes from comparing genes of extant members of the ancient phyla and using the concept of the molecular clock mentioned earlier. At issue is when the most fundamental divisions in the animal kingdom take place, the split between an aggregate of phyla called protostomes and those called deuterostomes. These two groups are separated by fundamental anatomical and developmental differences in embryos. The protostomes are composed of the arthropods, mollusks, and annelids, among others, and they are characterized by embryos that, as they develop and grow following fertilization, form a mouth out of a central opening in the growing larva called the bladdospore. 
In deuterostomes, echinoderms, us vertebrates, and a number of minor phyla, the mouth and the blastopore remain separate. There is a third group, the very primitive phyla that split off from the main stem of animal evolution prior to the great protostome deuterostome split. These include the cnidaria, sponges, and other jellyfish like minor phyla. The first to appear were the simplest forms, the cnidarians and sponges, which appear to be represented, as we have seen, in the Ediacaran assemblages of as much as 570 million years ago, the time interval before the Cambrian period, which began at 542 million years ago. But recognizable protostomes and deuterostomes are not seen until a short interval into the Cambrian period itself. If the protostomes and deuterostomes split, what was the last animal before that split like? Many lines of evidence indicate that this creature was bilaterally symmetrical and was capable of locomotion. Many who ponder this time and its animals imagine this last common ancestor of both the protostomes and deuterostomes as a small, featureless worm, perhaps like the modern-day planaria or the tiny and extant nematodes. But one of the great new discoveries is that this last member of the as-yet-undivided stock already had a genetic toolkit allowing it to begin some radical new engineering, and had such a toolkit for at least 50 million years before it was put into use. This worm would have had a mouth at front, anus at the rear, and a long, tube-like digestive system in between. It may have had stubby projections sticking out its side, perhaps for sensory information, touch and chemical sensing. But the point is that all of this was set up in such a way that rapid transformation could, and did, take place. This is new. All the tools and features necessary for the Cambrian explosion sat around for 50 million years. As noted, the base of the Cambrian is dated now at 542 million years ago. The base of the period has been defined as the place in rock where the first identifiable locomotion marks are found in strata, a certain kind of trace fossil showing that animals, moving animals, were present and could make vertical burrows in the mud. Yet for the next 15 million years, there seems to have been little formation of new body plans at all, or at least that we can find evidence of in the fossil record. The first real indication that a great diversification was taking place comes from the spectacular fossil beds only recently discovered in Chenyang, China, dated as 520 to 525 million years in age and mentioned earlier. It is an older version of the Burgess Shale and having common preservation of soft parts. Both the Chenyang and Burgess Shale faunas are dominated by arthropods, lots and lots of different kinds of arthropods. They soon became the most diverse animals on Earth and have stayed that way ever since. There are some estimates that in our modern day, there may be as many as 30 million separate species of beetles alone. Evo Devo tells us why. Of all the body plants, none can be so easily, quickly, and radically changed as arthropods. The reasons are just those listed by Carroll. Arthropods have modular parts. They have redundant morphologies that can be co-opted for new functions, and they have a set of Hox genes that allow ready transformation of specific regions in the overall body plan of segments throughout. The old view has been that new animals mean that there must have been new genes coming into existence. There is sound logic in this. Surely a primitive sponge or jellyfish would have fewer genes than the more complex arthropods. It was argued that the common ancestor of all arthropod groups somehow added new genes, new Hox genes, as these are those that are the switches that tell the various parts of a body how to form and when. But such is not the case. Carroll and others showed that the last common ancestor of the arthropods did not evolve new genes, it already had them, and that the subsequent and amazing diversification of so many kinds of arthropods was done with existing genes. As Carroll put it, the evolution of forms is not so much about what genes you have, but about how you used them. Ten different Hox genes were all that were necessary to utterly change and diversify the arthropods. 
Their secret was discovered by comparing the distribution of the product of Hox genes, proteins that are specific to a particular Hox gene, and where these proteins can be found on a developing embryo. The old idea that some gene or genes of an arthropod coded for the construction of a leg is false. The Hox genes make proteins. These proteins then become the means of starting and stopping the growth of particular regions of a developing embryo. Some of these proteins are concerned with making specific kinds of appendages. If those Hox gene proteins are somehow moved to different geographic regions on the developing embryo, the product that is produced will move as well. In this way, a leg that was formerly in one part of the body might suddenly be found in a totally new place. If, however, the Hox gene protein was somehow moved to the corresponding place on the embryo long before the leg was formed. Innovation came from shifting the geographic places or zones on an embryo that a specific Hox gene protein could be found in. Shifting the Hox gene zones in arthropod embryos resulted in the many different kinds of arthropods that we see. There are thousands, perhaps millions, of different kinds of arthropod morphologies, and all of this was evolved using the same toolkit of 10 genes. Arthropods are nothing if not body plans with repetitive parts. The specialization of these parts requires that each falls into a separate Hox gene zone. Stephen Gould versus Simon Conway Morris The Shape of Disparity There has been no end of ideas about why there was a Cambrian explosion at all. Sometimes events of the past seem as if they could not have been otherwise. Yet why not a long, slow formation of the many animal phyla instead of the seemingly compressed duration that we do see? And just how diverse were the major animal players in the Cambrian explosion? All of the current animal phyla, variably listed as about 32, first appeared in the Cambrian explosion. Surprisingly, there has not been a single animal phylum added to the world since, even after the devastating Permian extinction of 252 MA. But were there many more phyla in the Cambrian than now? Were there strange, fundamentally different kinds of animals in the Cambrian than now? That has been a very contentious issue, culminated in a late 1990s feud of memorable bile between the late great evolutionist Stephen J. Gould and Cambridge University's Simon Conway Morris, who remains, essentially, Britain's paleontologist laureate. In his wonderful life, Gould asserted that the Cambrian was full of weird wonders, which he defined as body plans no longer present on the Earth. His view is that the Cambrian explosion was just that, an explosion of new body types, body plans, numbers of species. But to slightly mix metaphors, most explosions are deadly. In fact, many of the new kinds of body plans, in Gould's view, new kinds of phyla, did not make it out of the Cambrian. Killed by the explosion, but not in the original sense. The effects of the vast increase in kinds of animals killed them by competition. With so many body plans, only some would stand the test of natural selection. Gould's view is that the diversification of body plans can be modeled by a pyramidal shape. The great diversification of body plans was fast, creating a fat base of the pyramid of numbers of body plans, also known as disparity. The diversity of body plans, not species. But as the Cambrian progressed, that base diminished, until there were far fewer phyla at the end of the Cambrian than soon after its start. Many others disagreed that disparity has, in fact, increased since the Cambrian. Simon Conway Morris is the leading proponent of this point of view, one that is in direct contradiction to that of Stephen Gould. In Morris's view, the weird wonders were not separate phyla at all, just early and not yet recognizable members of well-known and still living phyla. The consensus since this late 20th century argument, one that was heated to unseemly levels between scientists, seems to be that Gould was wrong, and we can add little to this argument. But if this once boiling scientific dispute has cooled to a low simmer, other aspects of the Cambrian explosion remain frontline science, 
the best science. Controversial science. New dating of the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion was obviously one of the most important, and until recently least understood, of major events in life's history as well. Much of the uncertainty came from dating, or lack thereof, at least in any sort of precision, and the older the rock, the greater the uncertainty. When he first defined the base of the Cambrian as the beds with the first trilobites within them, the early 18th century's Adam Sedgwick had no idea that actual age dating in years, rather than the relative appearance of fossils, would ever become available to his brethren, but we are sure he must have dreamed of the possibility. For almost 200 years, in fact, an accurate date for the base of the Cambrian was a case in point. A major problem was that it had never really been defined either in biological terms or with respect to the actual rock record, and numerically dated calibration points were few and far between. Unlike a mass extinction event or other biological innovations, the Cambrian radiation did not have a specific, obvious, well-defined starting point. The global definition of the terms was chosen instead by a special committee of international specialists organized by UNESCO under the auspices of the International Geological Correlation Program. Co-author Kirschfink was a voting member of this committee. At issue was the actual position of whatever boundary was to be chosen and how to date it. By the 1960s and 1970s, Age guesses, for they were nearly that, for when the Cambrian explosion happened, varied from over 600 million years ago to as young as 500 million years ago. It took the development of incredibly sensitive and precise radiometric dating techniques before progress could be made. The problem with dating was that in order to obtain radiometric age date, volcanic rocks had to be interbedded with the sedimentary beds as ashes for it is only the volcanic ashes, and only some of them, that contained the mineral zircon, which locks in uranium and lead ratios to form beautiful geological clocks. And almost none of these kinds of beds within beds were known from any Cambrian-aged rocks around the globe. In an attempt to try something else, a prominent Australian geochronologist named William Comston at the Australian National University in Canberra developed a technique in the mid-1900s using rubidium-strontium isotopes in shale, a sedimentary, not volcanic rock, that gave age estimates of 610 million years for the first trilobites in China. We now know that his technique was totally wrong, and that techniques based on dating the mineral zircon with the uranium lead are the way to go. Nevertheless, until the 1980s, the official date for the base of the Cambrian was listed as 570 million years ago, and that date is occasionally still found in many compilations of the geological timescale online and in books. But the second problem, not when so much as what, what first or last fossil occurrence should mark the base of the Cambrian, was more intransigent. As noted, by the 1960s, Paleontologists had improved their collecting methods and instrumentation, and it became increasingly clear that, in fact, a great deal of animal evolution, including animals with hard parts that could and did fossilize, predated the trilobites by great periods of time. The oldest hard part fossils and strata beneath those with trilobites were tiny but recognizable parts of shells, the small, shelly fossils. Some looked like tiny spines some like small snail shells, some simply chunks of what looked like armor from some archaic mollusk or echinoderm. But at question were their actual ages of formation and existence. International agreement was finally reached in the early 1990s. Of the four-part appearance of animals known from the fossil record, the first, the Ediacarans, were kicked out of the Cambrian period altogether. Their time received its own name, the newly defined Ediacaran period of the Proterozoic era. The base of the Cambrian system was defined as strata containing the lowest, vertically burrowing trace fossils, thus predating the successive strata with small, shelly fossils, which in turn underlay the strata with trilobites.
The ability to burrow vertically through sediments is thought to imply the existence of a hydrostatic skeleton and the neuromuscular connections to control it. But this horizon was nearly 20 million years older than the actual Cambrian explosion, as recorded by the fossil record itself. Yet, if finally sorted out, the dates when these strata were deposited was still unknown. Without reliable radiometric dating, the extent of this interval between the oldest recoverable animal fossils and the first appearance of trilobites could, in some regions, be measured in tens of thousands of meters of strata between the Ediacarans and trilobites. This suggested that tens of millions of years separated them. But the 1980-era mass spectrometers, the instruments that can determine ages from rocks, needed large numbers of zircons to do the analyses properly. However, technology advanced, and by the late 1980s, new, better instruments began to be used on the rare but crucial volcanic horizons that occasionally could be found in the sedimentary beds thought to be Cambrian in age. One such locality, discovered long after Sedgwick and all his contemporaries went to the great fossil record in the sky, or wherever paleontologists go, was located in the anti-Atlas Mountains of Morocco. Here was the potential Rosetta Stone for determining the age of the four acts of the Cambrian explosion. Age Breakthrough and Age Surprise It was in the late 1980s that co-author Kirschfink collected samples of a volcanic ash from the anti-Atlas Mountains of Morocco. This ash layer was stratigraphically located about 50 meters below the first occurrence of Cambrian trilobites in this great pile of sedimentary strata. But how long did it take for those critical 50 meters of underwater-derived strata to form? Unfortunately, this volcanic ash produced only a tiny number of zircon grains, far too little to be dated using techniques that were conventional at that time. However, by that time, Compston had developed an incredible instrument known as the Super High Resolution Ion Microprobe, SHRIMP, which was able to focus a collimated beam of cesium ions onto a small spot on a mineral grain. The plasma generated by this process was fed into a mass spectrometer, and with a few subtle manipulations, they were able to produce an extremely high resolution uranium lead date. The result was stunning. The dates emerging for these Morocco samples were about 520 million years, rather than being older than 600 million years in age. Compston did everything he could to try and make the age older, but it did not work. There was at least an 80 million year error in the age of the base of the Cambrian. This meant that the Cambrian explosion at least the massive diversification of the animal phyla that is seen when the first Shelley fossils appear, was more like a nuclear explosion, at least 25 times faster than supposed. Other groups at MIT, Sam Boring, and elsewhere have since replicated these findings with additional volcanic ashes from Morocco, as well as others from exotic places like Namibia and the northern part of the Anabar uplift in Siberia. There was now a date for the appearance of the trilobites, and it was far younger than previously supposed. The paleontologists charged with selecting the formal base panicked when they thought the entire Cambrian would be only 10 million years long, so they abandoned the first trilobites as their guide and chose an older event, the first burrowing trace fossil, that ultimately was calibrated at about 542 ma. It turns out that this unusual interval of the evolutionary activity and innovation has some other rather unusual features as well. Studies of the carbon isotopes across the Proterozoic Cambrian boundary show that something rather strange was happening, with huge oscillations that lasted for hundreds of thousands to millions of years. These are now known as the Cambrian carbon cycles. The magnitude of these is wild the equivalent of grinding up and burning all of the existing biomass on Earth every few million years. Either that, or something was causing extremely light carbon, which occurs in methane, to erupt into the atmosphere on a massive scale, with all of the associated greenhouse effects. Did the Earth go through a succession of short-term heating events? 
Mild heating can actually increase biological diversity by shortening generation times, an effect observed in the modern biota. Too much, of course, can be lethal. Another oddity is that the Cambrian has long been known as having some extremely large apparent plate motion. Plates are the enormous sheets of crust that compose the Earth's surface and that move, diverge, or collide with other of these Earth tectonic plates. These motions can be tracked using the technique known as paleomagnetism, which can determine ancient latitudes of rocks as well as the directions of plate motions. It was using this tool that co-author Kirschvink first proved the Snowball Earth episodes of previous chapters. New paleomagnetic analyses coming out of multiple paleomagnetism laboratories were showing something seemingly impossible, that the continents were scooting across the surface of the globe at great speed, or that the entire globe was rapidly moving under its poles of rotation. The North and South Poles were staying where they always were, it was the globe beneath them that was moving. This information came from samples taken from Australia, for example, indicating that while it straddled the equator, it underwent a nearly 70-degree clockwise rotation between early Cambrian and late Cambrian time, in less than 10 million years, and perhaps much less time than this. However, because Australia was a part of the supercontinent of Gondwana, which included Antarctica, Greater India, Madagascar, Africa, and South America, this rotation must have involved well over half of the continental landmass at the time. Now, data from virtually all over Gondwana tell a similar story. It was spinning counterclockwise precisely during the Cambrian explosion interval, 530 to 520 million years ago. Similar results from the large North American continent called Laurentia indicated that it moved from the chilly South Pole all the way up to the equator at essentially the same time. At this point, the god of simplicity appeared. Perhaps it was not a bunch of little tectonic plates moving around, but everything on the sphere moving together relative to the spin axis. However, this would work only if Laurentia and Australia were roughly 90 degrees away from each other at the time, which, duh, had to be true if Australia was on the equator and Laurentia on the pole. In fact, this single rotation hypothesis makes very specific predictions about the relative orientation and configuration of all continental landmasses, an absolute paleogeography. With apologies to Tolkien, one motion to move them all, one rotation to spin them, one translation from the pole and on the globe will find them. One simple rotation of the entire solid Earth around the spin axis brought around 90% of the previously scattered paleomagnetic results into a clear focus. Everything was happening at once. A big pulse of evolution, both in the number of species and in the body plans, a huge increase in biomineralization, the number in different kinds of outer skeletons evolved by many different phyla, the first predator-prey interactions among animals, huge swings in the organic carbon budgets, and wild oscillations in the positions of the continents, leaving scientists, including Kirschvink and his students, to ponder whether this was coincidence or cause and effect. As more and more paleomagnetic evidence began to accrue, not only surprising but also downright impossible motions of the ancient plates, with their entombed continents fixed in oceanic crust, were detected. Uniformitarianism tells us to use the modern to understand the past. And today, we can readily measure how fast plates are currently moving. In the Atlantic, where new oceanic crust is being created along the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, the rate at which the two plates bisecting the North and South Atlantic Oceans are slowly moving away from the axial origin line is only about one inch per year. These enormous plates, while created at the oceanic spreading centers, hold the continents in their stony embrace, so as, and where the plates go, the continents go as well. The rates are varied. For instance, today there are much faster rates seen in the plates being created in the Pacific Ocean area, with speeds of 3 to 5 inches per year. The fastest possible rate is close to 10 inches per year, but even this is theoretical and controversial. 
Yet paleomagnetic data were yielding speeds that measured multiple feet per year. This is impossible if only plate tectonics was involved. Yet the data are repeatable and stark. Something revolutionary took place, or at least something so different from modern processes as to cause enormous surprise in science. So much for the principle of uniformitarianism. The first reaction to encountering this data suggesting such fast motion of the surface of the Earth was to doubt the reality of the data. Fair enough. As Carl Sagan once said, extraordinary scientific claims required extraordinary proof. Continental motions were so fast that normal plate tectonic motions noted earlier, typically at most a few inches per year, could not explain them. The new data, slowly but inexorably being produced by Kirschvink and a few others, were showing that the plates were moving too fast for the conventional theory of plate tectonics. To top it all, most of this motion was happening precisely coincident with the explosive increase in diversity from the animal phyla. If it was not plate tectonics, what could it have been? And how could this affect the evolution of animals? The answer was a surprise, but should not have been, because a similar process is known to have occurred on Mars, the Moon, and many satellites and minor planets for billions of years. Such bodies are capable of astounding changes in orientation. On Earth, the consequences for life may have been inestimable. And yet our dawning comprehension of this possibility is one of the great new revolutions brewing in our understanding of the history of life. For over a century, geophysicists have known that the solid parts of a planet can move rather rapidly relative to the spin axis. The fundamental principle is that a spinning object would like to rotate around something called its maximum moment of inertia. A frisbee is a good example. When thrown properly, it spins about the center point, and most of the mass at the edge of the disk keeps it rotating stably. But now, put a small hunk of lead somewhere on the disk, but not at its center. The spin of the frisbee will change as it tries to reorient itself to take this new mass situation into account, and the frisbee will try to spin with the new heavy mass as far away from the rotational axis as possible. It wants to go to the equator. On a spinning planet, centrifugal and gravitational forces similarly tug on any anomalous mass. But on a spinning sphere, a much more orderly change takes place. The position of the spin axis will reorient so that the weight, which may have been located perhaps two-thirds of the way from the equator to the pole, will not be at the equator. The spinning ball has had its axis of rotation change position because of the strange new weight that was added. It is very well known that the Moon and Mars have both realigned themselves in this way during their geological history. Both had new masses added to their surface that originally were not on their equators, but then somehow ended up on the equator. For example, the gigantic Tharsis province, a geological region on the Martian surface, is composed of an enormous quantity of heavy lava. In terms of geological time, it was just like the weight we added to a frisbee or a spinning ball. It was added after the formation of the planet. In fact, it is the largest positive gravity anomaly in the solar system and lies precisely on the Martian equator. Now, that is. On the Moon, the pre-Apollo survey detected mass concentrations associated with the lunar mare basalts, also on the equator. These processes are fairly simple to understand on the Moon and on Mars because neither of these objects have plate tectonics. This realignment process is being termed true polar wander, or TPW. Prior to the discovery of plate tectonics back in 1966, all evidence for the poles being at different positions at earlier geological time was thought to have been a result of TPW. A geologically rapid change of mass on a planet can happen in a number of ways, including the impact of a big asteroid or comet, or even internally through the eruption of magma from the deep interior of Earth to its surface. 
Similarly, big mass shifts can happen when one of the parts of the plate tectonic features, which are composed of spreading centers and, separately, subduction sites, where a plate dives down back into the deep earth, either appear or disappear. Both of these are large enough to excite TPW as far as the Earth is concerned, as long as the masses involved are being maintained actively, not just floating buoyantly. But if they disappear, it will affect the orientation of the planet. Both subduction zones and spreading centers can disappear when one continent undergoing continental drift runs into another. Any offshore spreading centers or subduction zones between the converging continents are destroyed in the collision. Only in this case, it is the disappearance of a surface mass that causes reorientation, not the addition of a mass. As it is rather unlikely that the observed biological changes associated with the Cambrian explosion were forcing the continents to move, a more plausible explanation was that the unusual burst of motion was somehow accelerating the pass of biological evolution. Several mechanisms have been discovered that might explain and connect some of these observations. First, when continents are at high latitudes, they tend to build up large reservoirs of frozen methane, known as clathrates, or gas hydrates, on the seafloor and in permafrost. As these areas move toward the equator, they will warm gradually and can episodically cause pulses of greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere, periodically warming the environment. Evolution and species diversification in particular tend to proceed faster in warmer environments through a mechanism of accelerated metabolism. At the time this was proposed in the literature, it was nicknamed the methane fuse for the Cambrian explosion and argued that thermal cycling of biological diversity may have been one of the major factors in promoting the proliferation of species. It is also a possible cause for the crazy oscillation in the carbon isotopes. It also turns out that geographically higher diversities exist naturally in the equatorial zone. When Ross Mitchell, a colleague of ours at Yale University, looked at the paleogeographic motions during this true polar wander event, he noticed that almost all of the newly evolving animal groups seemed to originate on the leading edges of the continents as they moved into the equatorial zone, with few to none originating as other areas moved in the high latitudes. This increase of diversity with latitude provides a stunningly simple explanation for the diversity increase, particularly if this happened when nature was experimenting with body plans via the Hawks genes. It also implies that the paleontological record of this Cambrian explosion might be partially an artifact, because a side effect of true polar wander is to produce relative marine transgressions in areas moving onto the equator and sea level regressions in areas moving off. Sediments are preserved best during transgressions and removed during regressions. Hence, the rock record is biased during TPW events to preserve rocks that are recording a diversity increase. Invoking true polar wander as a cause of events in the history of life is definitely a new field of research, unheard of in the 20th century. Just as this mechanism is being used here as a new hypothesis for the Cambrian explosion, so too can TPW be used to try to explain the killing mechanisms in mass extinctions, one of which ended the Cambrian period and Cambrian explosion, killing off almost all the weird wonders described by Stephen Gould and Simon Conway Morris from the Burgess Shale. The mass extinction was given the unlikely name of Spice. Ending the Cambrian the Spice Event and the First Phanerozoic Mass Extinction Any history recounting the Cambrian explosion can be overwhelmed by the sheer power and importance of animal body plan evolution, the radical change of the world's biota from the immobile, floating, and simple larger animals of the latest Precambrian world to the diverse exuberance of the animal cargo inhabiting the world's oceans at the end of the Cambrian. But why is there an end of the Cambrian at all? Here is a topic where a long-held understanding has been toppled. Mass extinctions, 
the short-term periods of great mortality among both individuals and species, were variable in their severity. While the largest are included in the Big Five mass extinctions, when at least 50% of species died out, there were many more extinction events not as catastrophic, unless one was one of the victims, that is. One of the most celebrated of these occurred at the end of the Cambrian period. The late Cambrian mass extinction was actually three or four separate, smaller extinction events, mainly affecting trilobites and other marine invertebrates, especially brachiopods. It has long been accepted that these were caused by increases in warm, low-oxygen water masses affecting marine communities. Some of the earliest occurring of all trilobites, the olenolids, underwent total extinction, and in fact, the entire nature of the trilobite faunas changed. Trilobites of the Cambrian had many segments, primitive eyes, and no obvious defensive adaptations on the body, such as anti-predatory spines, and were unable to do what modern-day pill bugs do when threatened, roll up into a tight ball. After the extinctions, and thus in the earliest times of the Ordovician period, newly evolving waves of trilobites had changed their entire body plan. Now virtually all reduced the number of segments. Many segments are easier for predators to break through during a predatory attack than fewer thicker body segments, and had better eyes, defensive armor, and especially the ability to roll up into pill-bug-like balls. Warmth, low oxygen, and faunal change. That was the view of these late Cambrian extinctions. But then an entirely new series of data were recovered, suggesting quite the opposite. Evidence for cold water, not warmer. And evidence as well of a major burial of organic matter into the oceans, a process that caused oxygen levels to skyrocket. These changes are now named the SPICE event, after the Steptoian positive carbon isotope excursion. But there is a huge contradiction with this new finding. It was first identified in the rock record not only because of a sudden extinction of species, but also as a major perturbation of the carbon isotope record, and hence carbon nutrient cycling. There is quite good evidence that a large percentage of trilobites died out in a succession of short-lived extinctions near the end of the Cambrian period. One of the most interesting aspects of the SPICE event is that unlike most other mass extinctions, this one might have been accompanied not by a drop, but by a short-term rise in oxygen. It is intriguing to speculate that a known volcanic eruption at about this time might have caused one of the short-term rapid continental movements mentioned earlier, a TPW or True Polar Wander event. In this case, more land area was moved into the tropics for a few million years, increasing carbon burial and spiking the atmospheric oxygen up to previously unheard of levels. Something like that might have paved the way for the next major radiation of life following the Cambrian explosion. One kind of ecosystem needs a great deal of oxygen. The coral reefs appeared soon after the spice event, starting in the next geological period, the Ordovician. <laughs>